The Public Affairs Department of WIBG presents Shall We Overcome? Now, while I uh, can truthfully say, as I have said before, that I have experienced no discrimination as far as the law was concerned here in Philadelphia, uh, I should say that I owe, and I think all other attorneys owe, a great debt of gratitude to some of the attorneys who were practicing here, say, 25 years ago. Um, I'm sure they would not mind my saying so, uh, and I'm just using these as examples. There are others. But Judge and Mrs. Alexander, for example, have certainly been pioneers, and they certainly have smoothed the way for many of us who have come along a few years later. <laughs> The future of the black lawyer was not always what it seems to be today. There was a time when the possibility of a competent black man being allowed to prove himself before the bench was almost non-existent. But today, thanks to the pioneering efforts of a handful, the black Philadelphia lawyer has the chance to say, I have come of age. I will take my place with the white law fraternity. For the next 60 minutes, we will look into the history of the black Philadelphia lawyer, his problems, his fight for professional equality, the resulting progress, and his future. To help us, we have called on four of the most prominent black lawyers and judges in Philadelphia. They are Commons Pleas Lord Judge and former well-known defender Raymond Pace Alexander, his wife, Mrs. Sadie Alexander, one of the city's foremost authorities on probate, Austin Norris, longtime lawyer and early advocate of equality in law, and Mrs. Juanita Kidd Stout, former lawyer and presently a judge in Common Pleas Court. For Judge Alexander, the early days were far from encouraging. The problems that confronted the Negro lawyers 40 years ago, even in the city of Philadelphia, in the north of our country, right here in America. And they were manifold, they were tremendous. So I'm now throwing myself back 40 five years to the year 1923 when I came back to my home in Philadelphia. I was born here and what I faced, I'm a child of the ghetto, child of a poor family, six children in my family. My mother died when I was five years of age. I hardly knew my mother. If it weren't for pictures handed down in the family of a handsome, a beautiful, a tall Negro woman, I adore the picture of her that's right on my bureau now in my home in Mount Airy, Germantown section of Philadelphia, Mount Airy. If it weren't for that, I couldn't remember my mother because I was five years of age when she died, leaving six children. Six young children, I'm number three, right in the middle. Now, I fended for myself, went out to work for myself when I was 12 years of age, and I've been working ever since. But from discouragement came inspiration. I was a child of the family I just mentioned in a Baptist church. We had a great Negro preacher, Negro Baptist church of the middle to middle to lower class, not the high caste colored church, and there were several of them. And one Sunday, my minister, the Reverend E. W. Moore, tall, handsome, giant of a figure, beautiful man, marvelous voice, and a very great force in the community. Everybody knew in North Philadelphia, 13th and Mellon Streets. That's the ghetto. I lived there. Reverend Moore. He invited a great Negro lawyer, another giant of a man, and his name was known all through America at the time, William H. Lewis. What a grand and handsome man he was. Tall figure who was captain of the Harvard football team in 1898, 99, and 1900. He was the United States Assistant Attorney General. William H. Lewis came down here as the highest appointed Negro in America at that time, and until many years later, the highest appointed Negro. I saw this handsome Negro man, tall, six feet two, weighing over 200 pounds then, and I said, that's where I'm going to be, a lawyer. For others, like Judge Stout, there was some early discrimination. Well, I was born in Oklahoma in a time when there was segregation. And the members of my family range all the way from dark black to light white. 
Uh, my parents never discussed color in my home. Uh, they did not want me to have any color consciousness, and it was only when I was forced to go to a segregated school at age of six that I really became aware of color as such. So uh, I don't have any feeling like that. I mean, I associate with white people as freely as I associate with Negroes, and I associate with Negroes as freely as I associate with whites. It's just that way. People are people. The early pioneer, the fighter, then committed himself to a life of law. We found it in your difficulty in getting into the outstanding law firms, uh, law schools rather. Uh, they'd only take uh, a very few, one or two. In my class at Yale, there was only myself. There were, at that time, three Negroes in the whole of the Yale Law School. The difficulty was, of course, of getting in. After you got in there, I, I would say I was treated very fairly by uh, fellow students and by the faculty. Austin Norris, one of the early pioneers. Mrs. Sadie Alexander was probably the least accepted. I found professors who did not call on college students. I found professors who overlooked a college student when he or she raised his, her hand. But um, I did make the law review. However, I only made the law review because Philip Amram, who was the editor-in-chief, told the dean that he would not be editor-in-chief unless the people who were qualified were admitted to the, were elected to the law review, and I had qualified. In law school, you know, they have clubs and that is the way the students study together with the various members of the club. The women had a club, the John Marshall Club. I was not invited to join the John Marshall or any other club so that I had to study by myself. Our years after I had graduated and some of the girls who were in law school with me became more friendly, they also were ashamed and they told me how badly they felt that they had listened to, dean, to the dean who had told them that they should not invite me to join the law club. Of course, this was quite a disadvantage to a student. I would say that, uh, sure, all Negroes have had discrimination. I have had discrimination, and the fact that I am an, an attorney uh, has not prevented it. But when I said that I do not think there is much discrimination, I was speaking of the process of going to law school, uh, and becoming a lawyer and all of that. Oh, sure, we, are, we all uh, suffer our share of discrimination. The years of studying appeared to have been for naught. The acceptance was missing. I so well remember when my husband first came back from law school and, uh, came, and, uh, and took the bar, that a very fine colored gentleman and made the remark, what a pity to see another colored lawyer coming to starve. So this is about the philosophy of the Negro himself, that there wasn't any opportunity and he wasn't going to make a living. And the attitude of the colored people was that a white lawyer could represent them better because he was white, that the court was not going to respect the colored lawyer and therefore he wouldn't be able to succeed as well. So that it took, it was plowing virgin soil for my husband to start out and try cases and prove not only to the court, but to his opponents and then to the Negro population that he was a competent trial lawyer and prove it so well that he had quite a successful, a large white practice couldn't get an office in the, anywhere in the city of Philadelphia when I came here. I had to put, open my little office as a lawyer on Lombard Street. Lombard Street in the heart of the Negro ghetto in South Philadelphia. Lombard Street's the best place I could get. I went to all these buildings here. Land Title, West End Trust then, Western Savings Fund, Philadelphia Savings Fund. Went to all the buildings in Philadelphia. I don't mean a new PSF building, but some of these buildings I mentioned now were still a, were existing then, were good buildings then, the Packard building, the land title building, the Atlantic refining didn't have 
two floors of their 30 floors occupied, went to the INS building, insurance company, North American building, when it was built, only about three floors occupied out of 30. Wouldn't have me. Wouldn't have any. You can get anywhere in the city of Philadelphia today. From there, he now, having stayed there about a year, he was able to get in the Commonwealth building at 12th and Chestnut Streets. When the lease was up, we got notice we had to move. Rent was paid on time. We knew of nothing that we had done, but when they said that their tenants complained. So here we have a growing business, no place to conduct it. We went from building to building. Nobody would accept us. A good credit rating, no acceptance. Finally, my husband happened to meet a high school classmate who was in the real estate business. And he said, I'm gonna get you a place. And he found 19, second floor of 1901 Chestnut Street, which we occupied until my husband and I sacrificed everything we had and bought the our building at 1900 Chestnut Street. We occupied the second floor as offices. Well, it, it, I, I was uh, well aware that you couldn't get the uh, offices in Central City. And uh, I started uh, in the colored section, which was uh, the practice of most uh, of the colored lawyers at that time. I opened an office on Lumber Street in a 1500 block, a place that had been vacated by the People's Bank. It was a colored bank there, and I took over that office. I came here with some and letters of, of recommendation from uh, outstanding citizens, white citizens of Pittsburgh. I, my purpose was to attempt to get in the district attorney's office as an assistant. And I soon found out uh, that uh, it was just futile to even submit my letters. Uh, I found that was, at that time there was no Negro employed in any capacity except the, they had divided a, a job of, of 1500 apiece in the city solicitor's office between two Negro lawyers. Uh, uh, one was Sparks and the other was a member of the legislature. So uh, with, uh, with that, uh, uh, those facts in mind, I, I didn't make any further effort to seek governmental position. Oh, my dear, that's a long, that's a heartbreaking story. Uh, before, I might say that I took my Ph.D. at the University of Pennsylvania in economics with a major in insurance. But I could not get any employment by anyone in my field. So uh, when I married my husband, I stayed home for one year and I almost lost my mind. So my husband asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, well, I guess the best thing for me to do is to go to law school and then I know I can work. So he immediately consented. Of course, I say he consented so readily because he knew once I finished, he'd have a law clerk the rest of his life. Despite the hard times, the first drop of blood had been drawn. But it did not mean the black lawyer had been accepted as a Conrad of his profession. The judges were not kind to us, and I'll make known that now without any question about it. They were not kind. On the whole, they were not. Were one or two exceptions, and the exceptions were really in the Montgomery County courts. They were wonderful judges there. Fine, but in some of the other counties, they were never friendly to us and uh, friendly, friendly to us or showed any courtesy or considerations to the Negro lawyers that went up into those counties to practice. We saw discrimination from the very bench in Philadelphia where I'm now a member of the Common Pleas Court. We saw some very unkind conduct. They're all dead now, every one of them. But up until 1930 to 35, they were not very kindly disposed to the Negro lawyer at our bar. They were not. And I could name several, but this is not the purpose of my talk today. I could name several. And of course, the, the conditions among the race relations with respect to the liberality, with respect to the civil treatment of the Negro people of Philadelphia at that time is nothing to uh, be, uh, nothing to show 
Philadelphia in the very best light. Not whatsoever. What the problems confronting the Negro lawyer when I came to the bar in 1923, it would shock you. It would shock you. There were only 10 Negro lawyers in Philadelphia at that time. There wasn't one trial lawyer. Most of them, when they had the trial of cases, my dear friend, and this embarrasses me to say it, but it's the truth. They would go to the white lawyer to have them try the case, and they would sit next to them as the white lawyer tried the case. But we broke that up very shortly. We went to the bar as trial lawyers. There, was two, there were two or three lawyers, only one living today who was ahead of me, at, that is, who was older than I. But do you know, my dear friend, when I would go out of the county in some of the counties adjoining Philadelphia, and I'll not name them, but adjoining Philadelphia, we had a terrible time to get other lawyers to permit us to go in to, to handle our cases because in those days, a Philadelphia lawyer could not practice in another county unless the lawyers in those counties went to the bar and uh, to admit us because there were no colored lawyers in any other county than Philadelphia and one in Harrisburg, that was the nearest, and a few in Pittsburgh. Trying before one of our best judges in those days, one of the old judges now, Judge Finletter, trying to represent an Italian charged with a holdup, but not murder. But he was on bail, this Italian. And I tried it, and it was a long case. In the first Dave's case, the district attorney says, now, Your Honor, are we going to adjourn for lunch? I want this defendant held now. He's appeared in court on bail. Judge Finletter said, why, no, this defendant, let's call him Angelo Marino. He's gone bail. He's with Mr. Alexander. Mr. Alexander will take care of him. And this is a nice comment from the bench. Quote Judge Finletter. Mr. Alexander, you and this defendant go out and have a lunch. Come back. And this case will start at 2 o'clock. He's in your custody. All right, Mr. So-and-so district attorney, adjourn court. I went out with him to have lunch. So he said to me, Mr. Alexander come on, have lunch with me. I said, fine. He went over to Child's Restaurant on Chester Street. Child says, we can serve him, but we can't have this colored man eat in here. The criminal defendant charged with robbery by gun can be served on Chester Street. But Alexander, his lawyer, had to go down into the H&H, &H, that's Horn and Hart, our cafeteria, our automat, which was another block away, or not eat at all. So he said, well, come on out. I'll go down with you. And he and I ate at H and H. But I can well recall that one of the judges would never admit me to his chambers. I would have a problem that had to be taken up with the judge. He would come out of the chambers and stand in the office and never ask me to have a seat or invite me in the chambers where I should have gone to discuss the problem. On the other hand, I recall another judge whose name I'm pleased to call. He was Judge Thompson of the Orphan's Court. When I started to practice, my husband had a very, a very large practice. Uh, his, he needed someone to take care of what we call the Orphan's Court practice. It's called probate in some states. It has to do with the estates of minors and decedents. So <laughs> this work was assigned to me. I had a great deal of it because of my husband's practice in appointing guardians for minors and uh, estates of decedents. And Judge Thompson sent for me and invited me into his chambers and said that, Mrs. Alexander, you have a lot of this work. I want you to learn to do it so well that when a judge sees your name on a backer, he will say, I know this is done right. And I wouldn't go into the South to tell you many times. I, doors were shut in my face. I had to go into the back doors of, of uh, white courthouses in the South, all the way down, including the state of Maryland, state of Delaware. And I had lawyers, when they, lawyers, graduates of Harvard Law School, I would go to by telephone and write. They didn't know I was a Negro by my voice. They didn't know I was a Negro by writing letters. And they'd tell me to come down. They would introduce me to the court and handle the case when I walked into their office in, I'll never forget it, Anderson, South Carolina, North Carolina, South Carolina, Louisville, Kentucky, and Miami, Florida. When I walked into their office on civil rights cases, they closed the door in my face, and I had to go into the court. And uh, they were white lawyers in the South. These were the struggles we had in the 20s, late 20s. 
30s and 40s. And some would go to court with me, introduce me to the court, and left me standing there, and I'd have to eat eat at a fish stand among, run by colored people and uh, go to the colored toilet and sit up in the gallery and call, be called downstairs when the case started because colored people weren't permitted in the courtroom below and they had colored toilets, colored only, white only, and when it came time to eat, I'd have to go to the, take the little colored minister and go to his home if it was close enough to the courthouse, if not to the little stand on the street where they sold fish please, not hot dogs, fish, fried fish to the colored people, and that's the way I got. There were some who felt uh, that we were second-class citizens, and regardless of our professional standing, that is, regardless of the fact that I was a graduate of the Harvard Law School, the University of Pennsylvania with honors, and the high school here, and known all over Philadelphia, it made no difference with some of the minority. The client offered still another problem for some, but not all. I got to represent some few white clients in their 20s in, who were number backers. Uh, some of them, uh, knowing of my association, I was active in politics. And with Hall's uh, connection, uh, I had some breaks with the with the magistrates and the like, who were all of whom were Republicans. When I was practicing, uh, I had a partner, Miss Mabel Turner, and uh, she and I had quite a large practice, and we, I suppose, about, I would say, 20% of our practice at least was uh, white. We never found any discrimination. Yeah, I made no discrimination with respect to seeing clients. I had a large clientele, white and black, Italians, Irish, Protestants, what not. The ugly stigma of discrimination had reared its head. The battleground had been drawn and the minority sharpened its weapons. You couldn't go to a restaurant in central Philadelphia, anywhere in Philadelphia. The white restaurants closed the doors to us. Even the uh, the famous, uh, uh, the, the large, well, Horn and Hardart's and Linton's restaurants. Unless it was the automat, we couldn't go to a restaurant to eat. Automats couldn't see the color of our hands and face, and I put my nickels in. We'd put the nickels in for the coffee and ten cents for sandwiches, all right. But if we went upstairs to the Horn and Hardart's seated restaurant, they'd tell you to go downstairs or right at the door that they did not serve. Now, this is a 1923, 4, 5, 30, all the way up to 1939, when I fought hard all during the years for the law, for the anti-discrimination law and the Negro right, the law uh, against discrimination in public places, which was passed in 1939, and it would probably shock you to realize that we couldn't go into a restaurant or a moving picture on Chestnut Street or a first-class legitimate theater on Broad Street or Chestnut Street or Walnut Street up until 1939 when the doors were closed against us. Now, that was true to the, with the hotels. All of those discrimination cases I personally brought my good wife, Sadie Alexander, a member of the bar, and I fought these discrimination cases, but of course, I had to go into the court and plead them. And, uh, and the courts were not kindly disposed to us. I was uh, located in the seventh ward. My office was there, and I lived in the seventh ward. And at that time, Charlie Hall was the powerful Republican leader, probably the most powerful next to there. And, uh, I, I came here and I started a little newspaper, and I fought the establishment of this newspaper, which I developed to a circulation of about 8,000. And uh, through that newspaper, I, I attracted the attention to myself of, of Hall and some of the other Republican leaders. And I became uh, a, 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 not only a, a, a follower of Hall, but uh, rather a friend of Hall, as a young man. And uh, that cleared the way for, for contacts uh, in the criminal field, in all of the station houses. That's where the, the, your cases usually came from during those years. You got them at the station house where they started. 
and at Twelfth and Pine, I got nearly all of the cases of Negroes under the direction of Hall. Alexander took the legal road, Norris the political road, and together they hoped to lay the first block of a foundation that would stand true for those who followed. Headway was being made. Only one door stood in the way now, discrimination at the very roots of the profession. Twenty years ago, the American Bar Association, Negroes couldn't uh, become members. Uh, I don't care how distinguished he might have been. You could, during that same period, you could join the, the local bar association. But the local bar in the 20s was a very weak thing. Uh, it was uh, clearly, the bar association uh, had only the membership of the large firms. Uh, I think out of some four or 5,000 lawyers, it, uh, the bar association in those days consisted of about four or 500 members. Then, uh, 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 Siegel, Bernie Siegel, became the chancellor of the bar. And it's during his reign that the bar became more democratic and more representative. The Arkansas Court has uh, very many appointments of guardians ad litem, uh, trustees, all, all kinds of lucrative appointments. I have been appointed twice in my 41 years. The first time was by the President Judge Lamorell, now deceased, and the second time by the present President Judge Charles Klein. Uh, only, but only twice in very small matters. Many lawyers uh, are favored with these appointments. I don't know the basis upon which they're chosen, but I would say that I was qualified to be chosen more than twice in 41 years. You must always remember that I am not only a woman, but a colored woman, so that I have the handicap that all women in the profession have. And I cannot always distinguish what happens to me as being based entirely upon color. It may be based upon sex. Years ago, the women lawyers had a social club, and I used to go to it. I was invited to join, and I enjoyed the women until I found that the most they talked about was the appointments that had been given to men. Be men. And they, some of them would say, who gave it? And they mentioned the name of the judge. What do you think of that? And my husband plays golf with him almost every week. Or he and my husband belong to the same club and so forth. So that the women, as a rule, do not get the same preferential treatment that the men get. And I didn't expect this preferential treatment. So it didn't cause me to want to spend an evening to discuss what I didn't get. I would rather go ahead and work what I had. And I was able to make a good living and I hope a good reputation. I believe that the women should work in the Philadelphia Bar Association. Now it is quite true that we have never had a woman who was on the Board of Governors. And to my recollection, none who's been on the, only one, I believe, was on the Judiciary Committee. I was the first colored woman admitted to the bar, not only in Philadelphia, but in the state of Pennsylvania. So I was a novelty. <laughs> and when there were not many women at the bar, and I would say that the women as a rule, as a whole, did not have it easy. In the early years, in the 20s, the bar here was controlled almost absolutely by big offices. They could do no wrong in this, and the, the small fry lawyers who was uh, practicing by himself, that's true, white and colored, why uh, they were held to the strictest kind of conformance to the equities and ethics of the bar. Uh, they dominated uh, the the uh, judicial posts. In the 20s, there was, uh, not only was there uh, their uh, opposition to Negroes for any official position, but there was opposition to Jews and to Catholics. With the rise of the Democratic Party in the state, uh, the, the bar became more democratic because of, of the, uh, the Democratic Party was a fusion of, of the minorities. 
Uh, you had the Italians, you had the Jews, you had the Negroes. Up until the time, uh, well, I better say no longer than 20 years ago, we were never appointed to any committees of our association. None whatsoever. Never member, never appointed. A Negro, I don't speak of myself, I'm talking about the general rank and file, all of the Negro ignored as far as membership in the bar association committee is concerned. Think of it. Not a bit, up until 20 years ago. Now this is, all, and I'm generous when I say 20 years ago. I can name the, I can name the uh, chancellors who, who changed this. Bernard Sigel, president, president of the American Bar Association, was one of those who propounded great changes. And my good friend, uh, think of the name now, uh, uh, Chancellor, Chancellor, Walter Gibbons, he started it. I went to these chancellors and told them it was a horrible thing. We had then as many as 20. Now, mind you now, in 1923, there were only 10 Negro lawyers at the bar. Today, you have 107. 107. And that's not many, my dear friend. That's not many. New York, there are 450 Negro lawyers at the bar. Probably 500 now. In Washington, there are nearly 1,000. And we have, as, uh, of course, in New York, there are a million Negroes. Here, there are 485,000 to 500,000. In Washington, there are half a million Negroes, but they have uh, nearly 1,000 lawyers. The percentage of lawyers in Philadelphia, the proportion of the pop Negro population is shocking. And the numbers being admitted each year, are, it, the number is so small as to raise a serious question whether, there's not, whether or not they're fair to the Negro applicant. Cries of foul still exist today. And the problems of today's law school graduate may appear to them to be as insurmountable as that of their predecessors. Seven men took the bar last year, one admitted. And he was so fair, they don't know whether he's colored or white. He looks like a white boy. And some of the able students taken the bar. Three of them were law review men at various, at very high class law schools. Villanova, Temple, and Howard University. Law review men. And they've taken the bar two and three times and have not passed. Serious question raised there. Do you think the Bar Association in Philadelphia may be discriminating? Well, I don't think, I don't want it. The Bar Association wouldn't. It would be the law, it would be the Committee of Examiners of Law Papers, or whatever you want to call it. But now I don't raise that question. I, I don't, I can't say that positive, but I wouldn't dare say it. But it's a serious question. When able men, seven or eight men, take the bar two and three times, and men of good records from colleges and law schools not able to pass, and men of lower rank, from lesser law school, past the first time. And these men even take the CRAM, notice, C-R-A-M, the CRAM courses. This last uh, examination, when 82% passed, and still only two out of the six Negroes, or 33 and a third percent, passed the bar. Now, two men uh, failed from Pennsylvania. Uh, students, uh, one graduated from the uh, in preparation for law, he, uh, he finished the Wharton School, and then he was in the middle of his class at, at the Penn Law School. He failed. And then there's one that's taking his LLM at Penn. He failed. Now, Penn is one of the five, considered one of the five best law schools in the country. Temple's an excellent school. Villanova's a good school. The University of Pittsburgh's a good school. And how can you account for the Negroes accepting the say, receiving the same kind of training, legal training, was qualified for the same uh, 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 qualifications as others for uh, to accept a degree, to obtain a degree, failing in such large percentage and whites passing. I feel that <clears throat> the fact that such a large percentage of the Negro applicants for admission to the Pennsylvania bar do not pass the bar examination is something that the bar itself should inquire into. Uh, of course, it is unfortunate that a student who goes to law school has no assurance after he graduates, whether he's white or colored or whatever ethnic group he may be, that he's ever going to pass the bar exam. And this destroys so many capable people. And therefore, as I feel that when you find uh, out of a particular group, a large percentage not passing, that it's the responsibility of the Bar Association to examine into the facts is, did this student qualify or didn't he? 
and that it shouldn't be left on the burden of the poor student to defend himself. He, he's in a, a, an enviable position. He's afraid that if he makes a charge, that he'll never pass. And it's possible, because they mark on a curve, that when he takes, took it one year, uh, a, the next year then didn't pass. The next year, even a brighter group may come out so that he didn't make the curve. But what is the cause of this n large percentage of Negro students not passing is something that should be taken up by the bar itself. There's one young fellow that uh, finished Brooklyn Law School that uh, took the bar examination in New York and passed the first time. He took it here six times. The last three times prior to passing, his mark was 65. This in itself looks shady. It, 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 how could he three different times make the same identical mark? And Justice Jones, who was then Chief Justice, he went to, to see him to see if he could, uh, through his permission and his backing, uh, take it again. This looks suspicious to Justice Jones, to Chief Justice Jones, and he ordered that he be, taken, be permitted to take it again. He took it again and made 73 or 74, because Jones had ordered that he be permitted to take it. He is one of the, the very competent young trial lawyers at the bar. His name is, uh, is Harris. Well, Mr. Norris, do you think discrimination is being practiced in the administering of bar exams today? That's been our grievance, That's, and it, it seems to be a justifiable one. Uh, here you have, over the last 30 or 40 years, an average of one or two Negroes passing the bar in Pennsylvania, regardless of how many applicants there are to, in the examination. Now, they come from the same law schools as the whites. They're trained at the, even those that's trained at the, the best law schools in the country, so-called best law schools uh, of the country, uh, they're finding it most difficult as a Negro to pass the bar here. There was a period of eight years when no Negro was admitted to the bar of Pennsylvania. And as far as, as we can uh, uh, discover, during the, that entire period, there were at least six or eight uh, uh, Negroes each year making application. Now, uh, with this kind of a record, the only explanation can be made is that uh, there was some discrimination. WIBG News made an attempt to learn more about the administering of bar exams, but it was made quite clear that we were not welcome. Questions directed to the very office of state examiners in Philadelphia were met with coolness, if not evasion. There is agreement on one point today. The future offers at least a chance for the young black lawyer, the chance that did not exist for their father's or their father's father. The one question we put to each of our guests is, will the years ahead offer more of a chance? It's definitely brighter for many reasons. One thing is what the law schools are doing. They are actively seeking Negro students. The University of Pennsylvania is going out after them and has a fund to assist them financially for those who are capable but of being admitted but financially unable to meet the cost. Harvard has a course that they give in the summer to determine the aptitude of the students and they take the best qualified of these college students who come in the summer to school. And also, many of the other schools, Yale is doing the same thing. They, they are in the need for the colored lawyer has been recognized by the law schools. And this is a most promising thing. Uh, of course, we're hoping that many of the young men who come from the South will go back to the South to practice and not congregate in the metropolitan areas. The Negro attorney, uh, the future is very bright now. Uh, there's not a 
a big law office that doesn't want to to uh, uh, exonerate itself from a charge of prejudice. In the last three years, most of the law, large law firms have asked uh, asked some of us Negroes at the bar to recommend some of the outstanding Negro graduates come into their firm. The Dilworth firm was the first to break uh, through with uh, one of the real great minds in the law here, and that's Bill Coleman. Uh, uh, the firm uh, refused to accept the Bill Coleman, and uh, at first he had to go to, to New York, although he's the number one man at Harvard, and was the law clerk for Frankfurter, a, recommend, a qualification that no firm would have turned down except on the ground of color. After staying there for five or six years, uh, it was then that uh, uh, Dilworth uh, I, I felt that he couldn't stand the charge of discriminating against a qualified person wholly on the ground of color that he took to Coleman in his office. Just a few moments ago, uh, a very interesting and interested uh, young lady came in. She's just in high school, and her parents brought her in uh, to talk to me about uh, the possibility of going to law school and what it was like to be a woman in the profession and what it was like to be a Negro woman. She was a very bright little girl who is just a freshman in high school, but she's beginning her planning now. And I think there will be many more young people, both Negro and white, who go to law school, and I certainly hope so. Now the future's great. I have no complaint, but we don't have the young lawyers coming up as active trial lawyers, courageous, uh, fearless, but of high ethics, high ethical standards. I always insisted upon going there and fight your case clean, win, lose, or draw, go right like a man, take every, to give everything you've got to it, be courteous to the court, always be faithful and truthful to the court, and true faithful to your client. We haven't got many trial lawyers today. Out of the 107 I told you at the bar today, 50 of them have some kind of position, more or less. 50 of them, you've got nothing wrong with it, but we are losing trial lawyers. White bars losing trial lawyers, too. 50 of the colored lawyers, fine fellows, are in maybe more. Oh, maybe 20 are over our age now to the point where they cannot give their time to it. Uh, that leaves, say, 80, 87. And out of the 87, 57 are in some kind of good positions. All oh, the new, new authorities, the new positions, the new uh, uh, development authorities, the uh, various commissions and so forth of the federal government, assistant district attorneys, assistant city solicitors, fine fellows, and, uh, and they're high, talented fellows, high-class fellows from Harvard, Yale, Penn, and other law schools. I include also Villanova, Temple, and after they're here two or three years, they get a big appointment and we miss them at the bar. I love to see my attorneys coming, but we don't see them. The plight was great, and for some it will continue to be great. But with people like Judge and Mrs. Alexander, Mrs. Juanita Kid Stout and Austin Norris, the future has to offer an end to the confinement of the black lawyer. Those who paved the way creeped before walking. Now some of the stones on the road have been removed. Total acceptance now seems inevitable. I'm John Murphy. Shall We Overcome has been a presentation of the Public Affairs Department of WIBG.
This is John Murphy with what we hope will be an informal but stimulating sequel to the program you have just heard. In the next few minutes, I will attempt to make a candid report on how WIBG News went about making such a detailed report of the Negro lawyer. Uh, I must admit we approached the assignment with a limited amount of knowledge on the subject, but after spending weeks investigating who, why, and where, I think we all may know more about what now looks like a situation that frankly was at the heights of professional discrimination. We learned a few things we did not expect to learn, as is so often the case when you attempt to do a detailed study of any one subject. Mrs. Sadie Alexander, as we mentioned, a prominent lawyer in Center City, proved to be the most interesting, not only in her knowledge of the history of the black lawyer, but also because of what looks like might have been a disastrous ending to a number of honest years of attempting to learn. Mrs. Alexander probably showed the greatest fortitude of all, not only because she is a Negro, but also because she attempted to enter a field that was known then as a man's world, that of a lawyer. If Mrs. Alexander were to make the same attempt today, it's clear that she probably would not have run into the same problems. The fact that she was the first woman admitted to the bar in the state of Pennsylvania, and the fact that she is a Negro, makes her somewhat of a living martyr. Well, Judge Raymond Pace Alexander was the most colorful, and descriptive man that you would want to meet. His animation and recall was amazing. His relentless fight for the black lawyer at a time when it was accepted that the black lawyer was taboo has much to do with the equality the Negro has today, not only in Philadelphia, but also in other cities in the nation. After talking with Judge Alexander for over an hour, it was clear he was a man to be reckoned with, but only when he saw discrimination. Many lawyers, black or white, in the same situation 40 years ago would have yielded to the great pressure of the day. But Judge Alexander, unaware of how history would look upon him, fought back against tremendous odds. Mrs. Juanita Kidd Stout, now a member of the Common Pleas Court, is a result of the early efforts of the Alexanders and Austin Norris. It was an interesting comparison, really. Mrs. Stout and the other three guests as you remember, Mrs. Stout saw very little discrimination, probably because she is the youngest of the four and the groundwork had been laid down decades ago by the other three. Austin Norris, the oldest of the four, was the first to see what he was up against. And as our program pointed out, Mr. Norris took the political battlefield, whereas Judge Alexander chose the legal road. The early efforts of Mr. Norris obviously did much not only politically and legally, but he also showed his followers that the Negro lawyer could fight and should fight. Now, to wage a fight during the early years took courage. There seems to be little doubt about that. Not personal courage necessarily, but a courage that reflected an interest in his fellow lawyer who was experiencing the same discrimination. The end result has to be that the Negro lawyer has come a long way because he is a fighter and continues to be a fighter. But more has to be done, and not necessarily by the black lawyer. It should be, include all who may discriminate. This is John Murphy, WIBG News.